have a scooter wheel I can use as a dynamo. The power from the wheel goes through a bridge rectifier, then a boost converter to push it up to about 20 volts DC so it very slowly trickle charge the emus. Not much, less than a full watt, but hey, every little bit helps. Hey everyone, today we're going to be looking at the emus backup battery. As you know, I like to look at these batteries because I think it's a very important foundation for disaster prep. And a lot of prep is focused on people who live in rural areas and can have gas generators and all that. Large power banks like this are more suitable for urban and suburban folks. And if you have roof access or a balcony, you can even recharge them with a pretty compact solar panel. Okay, let's take it out of the box and take a look. All right, on top we have the accessory bag, user manual, right off the bat, having two handles is nice. A lot of these power banks have one and it's a pain for me to move them around by myself. It's just a bit under 15 kilograms. Uh, so probably not a big deal for most of you, but if you are getting them for an older relative or someone smaller like me, it's something to consider. The ports are fairly straightforward. It supplies 13.3 volts DC from a car charger socket and these two barrel jacks. It has four USB-C and two USB-A jacks. All are USB PD which can charge laptops and supply a variety of voltages up to 100 watts. In the back, it supplies AC mains voltage from the free outlets in the rear. As we've discussed, it's always best to use DC if it's an option. With any backup battery, you lose some power going through an inverter to convert DC to AC power. Not a lot but enough to avoid it if you have the option. Also on the back, above the AC output socket is an AC input socket for charging. The AC input requires a C19 connector. That's one of these. I'm not a fan. It's a non-standard connector, and if you lose your power cords, you probably don't have another one just sitting around. C14 is standard, and everyone has a few of those around. The other input is this XC60 jack for solar. The implementation of it on the EMUs is quite good and it takes anywhere from 12 to 60 volts with a maximum of 600 watts. That's something we are going to take advantage of in a minute. There's also short circuit protection there with a reset button. Now the battery itself is 1500 watt hours at 51.8 volts. It's a ternary Levian NCM or nickel cobalt and manganese battery. That makes sense in this application since lithium ion phosphate would be heavier for the same amount of stored energy but would allow more charging cycles. Since you want to be able to move it around, the rated 2000 charging cycles should be more than sufficient. Using it is pretty straightforward. Hold down the power button on the front. It shows you the charge level, then you can hit the DC button for DC power obviously, and in the back, AC for AC power. You are going to need a little light to power it on in an emergency, but honestly, that's all there is to it. It's not complicated. You charge it just by plugging it into the wall. I check mine once a month or so and try to keep them between 60 to 80%. Keeping them higher will take a tiny bit of the battery life but it also means the extra power is there when you need it. It's kind of a personal choice. Now, in the event there is no power, you can charge it via the XD60 jack with anywhere from 12 to 60 volts with a maximum of 600 watts. Realistically, this usually means solar, but it doesn't have to. 
that could be a small hydroelectric pump, a wind turbine, or something as silly as a converted exercise bike, or even dog power. So let's have a little fun and I'll show you how that would work. As most of you know, this is my husky Momo and this is Fatai. He's an Akita I'm fostering for a while. Okay, this is a slam meal. It's a kind of treadmill for dogs and it is where they get a lot of their exercise. I'm going to make a few changes to it. For dog power, there used to be a special breed known as turn speed dogs. And they walked inside a wheel to turn a big piece of meat over a fire and cook it evenly. Turn speed dogs looked a bit like corgis and may even be related. They were low to the ground, small and sturdy. This meant you could have them walk inside a fairly compact wheel. This is mechanically efficient and there's less power loss than with other methods. Momo and Fatai aren't so small and will require a very, very large wheel to walk comfortably. So I'm converting the slack mill instead. The problem with using a slack mill instead of a wheel is a lot of energy is lost as heat due to the friction of all the components. It's nowhere near as efficient, so we won't be getting a ton of power out of it. But hey, they work for food, and regular exercise keeps them healthy and out of the wet office, so it's a good deal. The first thing to understand is it takes an enormous amount of kinetic energy to make even a tiny bit of electricity. This is why normally people and animal powered machines do best when they convert motion into other kinds of motion, not motion into electricity, like old fashioned treadle powered sewing and other machines. So for this first proof of concept, I'm driving everything mechanically since I have a whole box of bells, bearings, and pulleys from other projects. This is just to test things though. One thing I'd like to be absolutely clear on, if you ever try something like this, make sure your dog has fun and you stop when they stop having fun. Both Fatai and Momo are used to walking on a treadmill, it's just the trick bow is new. It can take days, weeks, or even months to fully train a dog to walk, let alone run on treadmill. You can have them harness initially, but only using a chest harness they can rest against, not a collar. A collar can choke or injure them if they stop walking or running suddenly. A harness is something they can use to keep their balance while they learn, the same as we hold onto the handrails on a treadmill at the gym the first few times. Never leave your pet alone on a treadmill or slack mill. There are more than enough moving parts to cause serious injury. Okay, so the proof of concept basically works, at least at a slow walk. But obviously, that isn't safe or healthy for more than a few minutes of testing since it feeds the dogs continuously while they walk. I need to train them to walk or run a few kilometers, and then it dispenses food for them. I can do it with another wino and a few parts, but I thought I'd try one of these. This little device is a microcontroller platform from a local Shenzhen company called M5 Stack. It's based around the ESP32 and has a whole ecosystem of accessories around it. In theory, it should have been a perfect platform for prototyping this. In practice, it suffers from the exact same problem as almost all of these types of products coming out of China. Great hardware, great build quality, great specs absolute garbage drivers and documentation. Am I an expert at this kind of programming? Not by a long shot. But usually, with good hardware and good documentation, I can get what I need done. The M5 gave me nothing but problems. I asked them for help with some issues. They weren't really interesting. I can get help in Chinese from a company a few kilometers away as a hardware YouTuber? Probably they won't be giving you the time of day either. There's a reason Raspberry Pi and Adafruit are still on top. 
you don't need a lot of very specific expertise to use their hardware. It's for everyone. They don't rely on buggy firmware, have a huge helpful community, and kind of anyone can get something working. As nice as the M5 hardware is, if you are like me, a Jew of all trades, mistress of none, you are probably going to be frustrated and can do whatever it is faster with different hardware. If you know exactly what you are doing and have a lot of patience, it still might be a good platform for you. But I'm going to figure out another way to do what I need. I'm attaching the bridge rectifier and the boost converter to this 3D printed mount with his set inserts. And then putting it all in this clear PVC pipe to protect it from the weather. First, I power on the EMUs, connect the 12 volts DC cable, and turn on DC output. These three switches power the dispenser on. Select menu or automatic dispensing. And when it's in menu mode, this goes forward and back. So instead of messing around with another Wino, I just got one of these. It's for measuring bowls of cloth and stuff like that in a factory. You set how far the wheel turns, and when it goes that far, it closes a relay for whatever time you set. When the relay closes, it turns this DC motor which drives the auger in our clear PVC pipe and pushes the foot out and into the bowl. Maybe it's not as cool as making a custom circuit, but it's off the shelf, simple, durable, and that's what I need, so I'm going with that. While that wheel is measuring out the distance, this wheel is generating power. As I said, it's not much, but hey, dog power is free power, so why not? I also put a solar panel on top to keep them in the shade on hot days and keep the power topped up when they aren't on it. I might even add some fans later also. After quite a lot of testing, it turned out Momo and Fasai prefer a slow trot and a very small nibble every half kilometer or so to walking a few kilometers and getting a larger treat at the end. Remember, they walk for trees, not a meal. I'm using freeze-dried meat, so it's very tasty. They don't need more than a tiny bit, and that's just to keep them interested and make it fun. They still get their regular meals and aren't being forced to walk out of hunger. But Tai will usually walk four to six kilometers at a time, but Momo is a husky, and on a cool day, will go as many as 10 kilometers, trees or no both get off the slack meal on their own when they get bored. The trees are nice, but not something that's going to compel them if it starts to get uncomfortable. A lot of people suggest intermittent rewards from the feeder. Do not do this. All of the data shows it causes behavioral problems and compulsive behavior. Do not loot box your dog. The damage it does may not be possible to undo. What makes this fun for them is the consistency of it. They get the same reward for completing the same task. Most dogs, like people, like having jobs. This gives them a job. Unfortunately, I have to keep an eye on Momo. 
because she thinks it's very funny to hop up on treadmill and keep her brother from getting any snacks. Okay, obviously that's some silly clickbait, but the general principles applies. If you have a bit of wind, a fast-moving stream, good sun exposure, or yes, even a couple of energetic dogs, the Emu's built-in power management makes it very easy to take advantage of that with just a few simple parts. But of course, most of the time, you are probably just going to plug it into the wall. Still, it's always good to have options. Special thanks to Jonathan Oxer of Superhouse TV for answering some questions for me about hooking up that solar panel. You should go check his channel out. Link is in the description. Of course, the primary use case for a battery like this, when the lights go out, camping, etc., is keeping cell phones charged and comms open. Often, cell phone towers are on a separate power system or have backup power and are still working when the homes are without power. AM, FM radio is almost always working. Knowing what's going on, if you have to move, if worse is coming, when the power will be back, if dangerous weather is coming, can literally be a matter of life and death. So comms are always our first priority but there are other things to think about. A use case that is quite critical and underlooked is medication. This may be for you, this may be for a family member. It's something I had to think about for one of my arms. Insulin has a short shelf life and needs to stay refrigerated. How long it can go without refrigeration depends on if it's been opened and what sort of insulin it is. But you don't want to be trying to figure out if your insulin has lost potency and trying to adjust the dose in an emergency. Now, a battery this size simply isn't going to power your refrigerator for very long, not more than a few hours at most. For that, you need something much, much larger or generator. And that gets expensive and bulky and isn't practical for a lot of people. But the Emus can power a small thermoelectric cooler for almost a week. Here, let me show you how that works. There are basically two form factors for these little insulin coolers, box and thermos. Initially, the box seems better, it's familiar, easy to use, but my aunt has diabetes and I ended up going with the thermos style. It's designed to accommodate its own ice pack so you aren't entirely reliant on electric power. And most importantly, it's more portable and low profile. These little boxes, there's no way to securely close them. You have to use tape or Velcro. And anyone who's seen them knows exactly what they are for. In a disaster situation, if there is triage occurring, you may not want to advertise a disability. This can fit in the outside pocket of a backpack and most people won't recognize it for what it is. Hopefully power outages are short, Hopefully, if they aren't, you can just stay home and wait it out. Hopefully, people won't be in a situation where they have to stay in school gymnasiums or any kind of relief camp. Sure, we can hope all that, but if the cost is almost the same between this unit and that unit, why not prepare for a worst case scenario? Needing to transport insulin discreetly while keeping it cold. Overall, the Emus is well made, easy to use, with no major problems I could find. It's just about as large as it can be and still be portable for a person my size. There's an app, but it's optional and you can just ignore it if you want. If you're interested, the link is in the description. That's it for today. Until next time, if I can do it, anyone can do it!